Hey everybody, today is HVAC setup day. And so I have two experts. We have Caleb, who drove all the way from Myrtle Beach starting at three o'clock in the morning um, from Kalo Services, which you'd also know him from the HVAC School podcast. If you haven't seen him explain some of the hardcore science behind HVAC, you should. He's brilliant. We also have a brilliant local contractor, Brent Ridley, who is with H&M Services, who is my first HVAC company that I will be referring my clients to here uh, from both his company and from the Tool Pros podcast. Guys, thank you so much for traveling to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. I'm excited to be part of the project. Absolutely. You'll be seeing a lot more from these gentlemen uh, down the line in future series and for sure on our YouTube channel. They are both experts in their field and they're very well versed in how to tune the actual science as if this were a lab, even though we're really in my backyard. So let's go ahead and get started. We're hanging the indoor uh, cartridge of the mini split, which looks like that. And we found our first pain in the butt. So we, you see the holes that we drilled, like way, they're not even close to that thing. And it's because the outside edges of this happen to be 16 inches on center. So if you put the middle of this right on a stud, then you're gonna have all the holes that you're trying to drill on the outside also meeting up with holes. This is one of the challenges of using international products. As you may know, we are longtime Mitsubishi users. Our tiny lab, the highest performance tiny house on wheels in the world, has a mini split just like this, except it's a half a ton unit. That's 6,000 BTUs per hour. This one is three quarter ton. That's a 9,000 BTU per hour uh, unit. And it's actually oversized. 9,000 BTUs, a quarter ton for 15,000 cubic feet of space, which if you divide by a normal ceiling height of eight feet is 2,000 square feet almost. That's pretty amazing. Now this room has no windows, so of course it's gonna be a little bit weirder than a normal house. But I love this piece of equipment because it ramps all the way down to where my load normally is in the shoulder seasons. When we have a party, that three quarter tons is gonna come in very handy. Let's boil down to basics really quick. A heat pump is an air conditioner that works both ways. It can take heat out of the house and move heat into the house. A heat pump is an elegant way to heat a home because it moves heat around. It does not burn something to make heat out of fire. So highly efficient, also very controllable and very um, adaptable to the conditions. And even as elegant and nuanced as it is, it's really a simple machine. It is two fans, one inside the house and one outside the house. And between those two fans, circulates a loop of refrigerant, something that is, has a different property than just water. And right now we're using something called R410A. Don't worry about the, what that is. But the fans, we obviously have invested in very high quality pieces of equipment. They're virtually silent. Here is the one that's on the inside. The one that's on the outside is that big box that you see, it's called the outdoor unit. And the refrigerant loop is something that I really wanted to make a big deal about in this video because the whole point of it is to move the heat from inside to outside or vice versa. And so when we talk about controlling heat flow, airflow and pressure, moisture and air quality, we talk a lot about insulation. Insulation is what you wrap a line set. That's what that refrigerant loop is called in. And most of the off the shelf line sets, number one, are gonna be 50 feet or less. I think I found something that was like 75 feet. I needed 100 feet for me to put the heat pump here where it belongs in the center of the house and to have the outdoor unit as far from where we're hanging out as possible. You could buy two 50 foot pipes and then splice them together. But of course, the more seams you have in things, the more problems you're likely to have. Number two is, because I've got 100 feet, I wanted it to be as insulated as possible. I don't want the heat bleeding out along the way of the refrigerant loop. And so, you also can't find insulation like this just off the shelf at a, even an HVAC distributor. Uh, we had to order this specially from Mueller Streamline. And there's a couple cool features about this. Number one, they can wrap it in whatever thickness of insulation you want. Each of these has one inch of insulation. One of them is gonna be hot, one of them is gonna be cold as it's circulating. The other thing about this is it's got this very durable uh, coating on the outside. It's called DuraGuard UV. So it's, it's UV resistant. And also what's more important that I didn't even think about until I started running this thing is that when you drill holes in walls, the hole is gonna be rough. And then when you drag this insulation through that hole, it's gonna get torn 
unless it has this coating on it. So this coating is actually favored by a lot of the HVAC pros that I work with because of the durability of it the first time you install it, not necessarily long term. I will say that this much insulation makes it pretty nerve-wracking to try and bend this into shape. If you try to manhandle this stuff too much, you'll see that this happens, right? So you bend it and it oh, kinks. And now refrigerant can't go through this kink. So now you can try and just do that. But of course, I've got a major restriction here. Smaller lines aren't gonna do that quite so easily. They bend a little bit more easily. But you can still, if you're not paying attention, kink it. So that's just a little note for those of you who are going to try and follow suit and do a more serious uh, insulation job. By the way, some states are requiring three quarters inch of insulation as code minimum. So going to an inch is really not that much of an overage. Now, even though I did build my own duct system, and you can see that in that previous video, I, I do think that DIY ductwork is possible when you have the right tools, which I use Malco sheet metal tools. I've got an entire kit of things that are very important to have if you're gonna start attempting that on your own. Um, but I do not recommend DIY equipment installation because frankly, there are just too many tips and tricks and techniques and tools that you just won't know about if you're not a professional who does this all the time. So please do make sure that you consult with an actual professional who has lots of experience in the field before you get yourself into a situation where you might potentially damage the piece of equipment that you're trying to install. The outdoor units, as you can see, I have set up uh, according to how Neil Comparetto, my friend in Virginia, has recommended, which is a gravel bed that is uh, contained by six by six ground contact pressure treated posts that are bolted together. And then the equipment is set down onto equipment pads. And I selected Hercules pads, which are very strong, very lightweight, very resistant to weather. This setup procedure goes basically like this. You set the equipment, you build any duct work that you need. And by the way, ductless mini splits now can have small amounts of duct work. The gray area is expanding. Then you run your refrigerant line set and your electrical wiring between the indoor and the outdoor units. You pump nitrogen into the line set and you find any leaks. Then you suck everything out of the line set to create a vacuum. What do we got here, Caleb? We have a really tight system, under 50 microns, in less than 10 minutes. So, is that your personal record? It's my personal record, yeah. We're adding seven full ounces of extra refrigerant into the system. But because you're smart, you're not gonna do seven, are you? Nope, about that much right there. 9.0. And it's because the hose also contains refrigerant. Release the refrigerant to connect to the controller, and then we do a test run. One of the interesting things about HVAC that you should be patient with your HVAC technicians about, <laughs> every day there's a new product, a new thermostat, a new control system, a new heat pump, et cetera, that these guys are supposed to be learning. And they show up at your house and they're an expert in every single product that you could possibly have. And now we've got all these IAQ things, right? People are trying to sell you UV lights and electrostatic filters that you can sell to your customers. Yep. So this is, you know, the more special, the more strange. For the testing today, we're using the latest technology, which is really important because you can use the old fashioned way, which is what's called a manifold. It's a bunch of hoses. You've probably seen HVAC guys walking around with them looped around and around their shoulders. This is the new way and everybody should be using these. This is how you run with one person an entire test to make sure that the thing is running at capacity. So you got to test the pressures, which you use now, this little tiny Bluetooth connector, and the temperatures of the line set. And uh, this kit is from Testo. A bunch of different people make this. This happens to be my kit, but you're not only testing those, you're also testing things like air flows and temperatures and relative humidity and things like that. And this all hooks up to the software that these guys are using today, which is called Measure Quick. So we're actually finding out, just like they did in the lab before they shipped this thing here to be assembled into a system, what it should be putting out. Temperature, uh, the, what's called enthalpy, which is the interaction of the temperature and humidity with all this stuff. So 
what, what are we doing right now? So we've got a whole range of measurements that we're taking right now. We're measuring the, uh, the suction line. We're, we're t uh, checking superheat, um, which on this particular piece of, uh, of equipment is between zero and three degrees. On average, um, we are, we're sitting at 1.5 right now. So that's right on. That we're also good. measuring the, the split between the supply and return. So it's going in through the top of the unit, coming out through the veins on the bottom. And we currently have a temperature split of 22 degrees, and that's with the fan on high speed. So that's, I mean, that's pretty. That's very impressive. Very, very, very impressive. Um, so enthalpy, uh, change in enthalpy is 9.5-ish. So that's. That's a rather large change in enthalpy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Now, isn't it just, let's nerd out for a second, because Jim Bergman, who invented this piece of software that we're using, I thought he taught me that enthalpy should be 6.6666. 6.7 is your golden number. Yeah. That's at 400 CFM. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're working with a mini split, so we're a little bit different. Um, so I, I assume that's why our enthalpy number is a little large. Mm -hmm. You know, I bought this at the store. It said, here's what it can do. We put it into the house. When do you get 100% like, yep, it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. What is our total capacity today? Total capacity is 8,900. So we're right on the money of what we should be based on where we're at. So I think we're good to go. Yep, we're seeing about 5,100 5, uh, BTUs per hour in Sensible and about 3,600 in Latent. Cool, and we, tech, we don't need that by the way. Today is a very temperate day outside. It's like what, 65 degrees or something like that out there. So we don't need any cooling today. We're just testing this to find out how it's going to run so that we can predict and prevent anything that does happen on a 92 degree day that is eventually gonna get here. So that's, this is what your professional team is gonna do when they set this up the right way, is to find out what it's going to do in the summertime when you actually are running at full capacity, right? So that then you can walk away and know, job done, I know for a fact that it's gonna work when it needs to work. Absolutely, yeah. you set it up now, so you're ready for those hot days, absolutely. There's your change in enthalpy. And it's so high because we've got low airflow. We've got about 219, that's estimated. Um, and our temp split's really high. So we're gonna have a, a, a high change in enthalpy here. And we're removing about 3.4, three and a half pounds of water an hour. That's pretty good. We look at our indoor, extended indoor measurements. We notice that our return relative humidity is about 66%. So we do have a bit of a latent load here and that's why it's, it's gonna remove some of that moisture sensible again is just what we feel like this is, it represents the number that you see on the thermostat latent it means hidden heat so uh, that's moisture that's um, we have about 35 3600 BTUs per hour um, of moisture heat load in the air and then this is the percentage sensible divided by total capacity and that gives us our sensible heat ratio so typically in most airflow calculations and capacity calculations, you're using a, a constant that's based on dry air at sea level, but we are able to actually measure what we've got here and take into account our elevation. So we're not right at 0 0.075 at, like we would in a standardized formula. We are actually able to see what we actually have as far as our return and, and supply air density. So it's making our, our measurements a lot more accurate. Here I am installing that Mueller Streamline line set for the ducted heat pump, which is very heavy. You don't want it to dip too many times, which is why I'm trying to fit it up toward the ceiling. Okay. Looking sexy. Everybody feeling sexy? I think so. Always. Always. Here's something that you always want to see from your contractors that you work with. They're opening the manual and reading it. Uh, this is one of the things that we just don't give professionals in the building industry very much of, which is time to think and breathe and just kind of sit with some of the information that they're trying to deal with. These guys are clearly doing all kinds of sophisticated things that, if they did something wrong, would potentially have disastrous effects on the comfort and durability and health of the house that we're trying to build here. So... If you can, encourage anybody who's a smart young person to go into these trades. It should be the kind of thing that is like aerospace, frankly. We need really smart people to be going into this, to be helping people to tune their homes. You have to be able to use the tools that you've got as well, not just pull them out of your bag and, and 
do whatever with them. Um, the, the smart application of all of these tools is incredibly important. One thing about this interior unit, the electricians ran a disconnect for it that was 30 amps. I told them that it only needed 15 amps, and it actually turns out that it gets run completely from this Romex that you see coming through from the outdoor unit. Once we hook up the condensate drain, we hook up the, the control system, again, pull out the manual, and we check all these codes and everything uh, that we need to program this thermostat with. Mm-hmm, that's what I like, damn. It's always nice when you start up your newly designed duct system, because you always want to hear what it sounds like, and it's like, is it gonna perform exactly like I wanted it to? Right, that's pretty quiet. So we turned on the system, and it runs, and you can hear it run, and you can feel it run, but of course, how it runs and how it turns out over the next couple minutes is very important, so you don't wanna just turn it on and then leave. Brent, you found out first that... Our lines were starting to freeze up. Yeah, we started to have uh, frost build up on our, on, our, on our refrigerant line, so that was saying, hey, something's going on. Yeah, specifically, uh, that's kind of a key indicator that the air is not moving like it should, and so we first tested the pressure, and inside of the line, uh, it was 0 0.03, which for HVAC speak is zero. That means no air is moving through this. There's no pressure. And so that the um, <laughs> do-it-yourself test that you can replace the $1,000 pressure gauge that we're using here was that Brett pulled out a receipt, which just weighs almost nothing from his pocket, put it up to a hole in this that we made because I'll see, I've sealed up all the holes and saw if it's stuck and it doesn't hold itself, then there's no suction here and the suction is the whole thing. So the fan wasn't able to move air and in the beginning, when you first run this thing, uh, you're dealing with all of the things in construction that have happened up to that point and this system has dampers all over it because you know I like to control and tune things. And so I started looking at all the dampers, like oh, open, 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 but we got over here to the two main trunk lines and both of those were totally shut. At some point, somebody, probably me, had just brushed past them and closed them. So that's important. You can check that beforehand. We didn't damage the system by leaving them shut for a few minutes, but you just want to make sure this is the time when you tune everything. And obviously, like testing, even of the sort that we've done so far with static pressure testing and things like that, does that happen on a course? Not really. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. You know, it has to be specific applications and things like that. Um, it should be done every install every startup, but unfortunately it doesn't happen that often. Yeah, and if you call a professional who does know what they're talking about, you say, hey, what kind of testing do you do? They'll be able to rattle off a list of tests that they're doing, and, and Brent is also running MeasureQuick on this system, just like we did on the last one, a performance test to tell how many BTUs the system is actually moving and how many CFM it should be moving and how the liquid line and the suction line and the pressures and the temperatures and all that stuff are supposed to be working versus how they actually are working. Again, turning what is real life into a laboratory, which you can do nowadays and you didn't used to be able to do. And a big part of it is these Bluetooth tools that we've got. We can be everywhere in the building at once because we've got the control over all the sensors. So now, We've cleared up the blockages, which were my uh, very smart dampers that I've opened, and we're at 0.3 on the um, pressure, the suction pressure, which is not a bad thing. This system particularly is made to deal with really high pressures. We've actually turned it way up so that we can get as much power of the airflow as possible. Do you normally, would you do that normally if you didn't have a dedicated dehumidifier? Absolutely, yeah. I, yes, because most of the time if you do like a retrofit, or something like that. The, the duct system's not designed to your liking. It's not designed the way you want to. So you want to make sure you're moving as much air as possible. A lot of times we'll, um, like on the furnace combo, we'll oversize the blower or something like that the, based on the AC because we want to move a little bit more air because we know the duct system's not exactly up to par. Mm -hmm. So but on a... So you're using the fan to fight against the fact that the duct system is maybe a little restricted? Exactly. If somebody doesn't want to spend the money to redo some ducts, so we'll, we'll upsize the fan. It's not the best solution, but, it, but, it, but it, you got to do what you got to do with, with, with people's budgets and whatnot. So. Here is the return. That's a central return. That means we're pulling all the air for this heat pump uh, through one opening as opposed to a bunch of different openings. That's room by room return. We did this totally intentionally. And you can see the reason for that in many of the other videos that we shot about this house, which I'm linking to right now. We've got this very pretty grill cover from Stellar Engraving. You can get things that are pretty. We put this in a place where we want to see it here. 
because we do not ever want anybody to put a couch or a table up against this thing. That would be the death of the system. This thing needs to breathe in here. So what I have inside of this is a two inch thick Merv 13 filter. As you can see, the air flow is indicated on the filter. It's generally with the wire mesh on the back side. And this is the box where all three of our major machines, which are not described in this video, but we've got the heat pump sucking air from this hole here. We've got the HEPA filtration system and the ultra air dehumidifier all pulling from this. I'm going to talk about those other two pieces of equipment, which are very important as well in other videos. So subscribe for that. But this depth here, because I built this box, I can increase the size of this filter slot to a four inch thick filter if I ever want to in the future. It's hard to be super um, accurate and not be very technical with this kind of discussion, but the filter that we put in there, based on the duct design that we had done by a friend of mine named John, who's very qualified, more qualified than me, said that the filter drop that we should have for the kind of filter that I use should be about 0.2 based on the design of how everything is going to work. And look at this, we're at 0.192, which basically close to 0 0.2. Yeah. That's kind of amazing. Like that tells you that the design became real life. Yeah. And that is so important because you could have every model in the world tell you like, oh, this should happen or that should happen. The weather, think about the weather. What's really interesting is that when they say it's a 30% chance of rain, it doesn't mean that it might rain 30% of the day. It means that they ran 10 models and three of them, it rained like hell. And seven of them, it didn't. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? So this is where it's really important to tune the assumptions you're making in the computer to what actually happens in real life, and that is what you want to see. That's the beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So this elbow, which is huge, this 16-inch round duct with this turn and this turn is adding another 0.1, another tenth of an inch of water column just from this length of duct right here. From that hole to this hole, we've built the pressure considerably. Again, not a bad thing as long as you've designed for it. So we make a big deal about the blood pressure of the system not being too high, just like a person's blood pressure. The before, right before we hit this piece of equipment, we had 0.3 inches of water column. And what we want in order for most systems to pass this black and white test, this is a pass-fail test, you either are good or you're not good, is no more than 0.2 which would add to the 0 0.3 to make 0 0.5, half an inch of water column. And we're getting just shy of 0 0.2 right here. So what that means is that this system would pass a normal system check, but this system happens to be configured so that it can deal with up to 0 0.8. So the fact that we're really low on this is great. You wanna pass with flying colors in general, and this one does. All right, so this is our system setup, 410A. 400 CFM per ton. It's a over 17 seer piece of equipment. And you can see this is a variable capacity um, as well as a variable speed system. So we've ramped down the compressor to about 14,000 BTUs total. It's rated for about, I think, 23,000 BTUs after we've corrected for the design of the area. So it's ramped down in order to match the load. So we would expect to see that closer to the green, closer to 23,000 BTUs on a design day. Caleb. What's up? You teach an HVAC tech class, right? I do, at Ori Georgetown Technical College in Conway, South Carolina. So if there's just one thing, you can condense your entire curriculum into a tidbit for people who are already in the, the field. It would be learning how to do the mechanics of HVAC and, uh, and of the trade in general isn't that hard it's just repetition it's I, I what i believe makes a great technician is the ability to focus a little bit more and put more, put more extra time into self-education on physics and human physiology because everything that we do is a function of physics and whether it's thermodynamics or or whatever it's uh fluid dynamics things like that and then human physiology, I mean, we're, we're here to, you know, for the comfort and health of our, of our clients. And to understand human physiology is to understand comfort and what makes the human body comfortable and healthy. So having a deeper understanding of those two things 
as supplemental to your knowledge of the trade, uh, the mechanical skills, it's going to take you a long, uh, uh, it's going to take you really far. And if there's if there's one thing that you would like for normal people, homeowners, to know about their mechanical systems, HVAC specifically, what would you tell them? I would, I would, I would encourage them to think outside the box because just the box isn't, there's no box product that's gonna solve everything. Um, so I guess I would encourage homeowners to ask questions uh, of their technicians, understanding that one mechanical appliance is not gonna solve everything um, inside of a home, generally speaking. So I would ask questions, get to know your technician, um, and if they're worth their salt, they'll be able to answer those questions. And if they don't know the answer to them, they'll tell you and they'll, they'll look up the answers for themselves and help you uh, grow with you. So don't be afraid to ask questions. If you don't know something, um, always ask. This video is so long without even getting into the testing and commissioning side of things. So we're gonna put that into another video about measuring the air flows and the BTUs coming out of all these registers and tuning the system, adjusting all the dampers. So I will show you that, but not right now. Uh, so please make sure that you have subscribed if you uh, have not already because you wanna stay tuned for all of that exciting stuff. Like and comment if you have anything else to add about the setup process. Thank you very much for watching. Tune in next time.